Namaste, my name is Pukar Mala, I'm the Executive Director at Daitwa and also uh, a coach at Nepal Leadership Academy. And thank you so much to uh, University of Edinburgh for this opportunity for us to share what we're doing in Nepal through the Daitwa campaign in nurturing youth leadership in Nepal. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, uh, the leadership model that we're using at Daitwa and hopefully that is interesting to everyone. But also in this process, I'm going to use Daitwa as a case study and, and show how Daitwa is using these leadership models to do uh, entrepreneurship development in Nepal. Nepal faces a multitude of challenges. Uh, there's a lot of focus on socio-economic, uh, socio-political empowerment, uh, not so much on economic empowerment. And the result of this is being very obvious in the way hordes of... Uh, young people are leaving Nepal. About uh, 1,500 young people uh, leave Nepal every day through the airport, the national airport, and many of them go to the Middle East, Malaysia, and uh, India, um, and, and some, of course, go to um, the US, Australia, UK, etc. But a lot of them go looking for opportunities, and particularly job opportunities abroad. And so then one begins to wonder why and what is happening because 1,500 per day is a very big number for the country. And this has led to a situation where we don't have enough human capital in Nepal who, to, to be able to grow and make use of our resources, such as agri-resources or water resources. We've not been able to, um, use, uh, to, to enhance the productivity of what we already have and turn them into value-added products and services in Nepal. So this, uh, and which, which further then exacerbates this problem because if, there are, if our productivity doesn't go up, then our competitiveness doesn't, and, and then there are not enough opportunity, job opportunities, which means, again, young people leave the country. So that's a colossal problem that Nepal is facing to a point where uh, we at Daikwa have begun to look at uh, whether our national identity is at stake because uh, the amount of governance instability, the kind of political uh, uh, poverty issues that exist in the country is leading us to think about what kind of nation are we looking towards in the next decade. And so clearly we see a vacuum of leadership because um, we don't think that, uh, you know, what Nepal doesn't have are ideas. Uh, what we think is that what we're missing, and we also don't think we don't have necessarily the talent or, or the resources uh, or the ideas. What we think, what we're finding is that we haven't been able to make use of the existing talent and resources to do things in new ways, and, and very importantly, to work together. So there's, there's a tremendous leadership crisis in our country, and uh, to address this, what Daitwa is looking at is uh, towards a vision of an enterprising Nepal where every young person will have opportunity for a prosperous future. And in the next five years, we, we, we are striving to nurture 5,001 young entrepreneurs, uh, one being ourselves, and of whom at least 2,000 would be women. So I want to go back to the problem and then describe the leadership model that Daitwa has before going into what Daitwa does. So I, I said that there is leadership crisis in the country. The question is, is this leadership crisis just amongst the political leaders or the bureaucratic leaders? Or is this also a crisis that we're feeling on the ground in terms of what communities have or have not been able to do? And I like believe that it's not just the issue of issues that uh, political leaders have, but it's, it's something where communities have a very important stake in uh, leadership. So let's look at the uh, model, models that we have been, we've been thinking about and why we find this interesting paradigm. This interesting is because if Nepal is at a leadership crisis and if we are able to come up with innovative not only would we be solving our own country's problems, but these models can have implications, can have use for the rest of the world. So we're truly guided by the, the possibility of these 
leadership models in terms of our future research, ongoing research. So there are, there are many theory, leadership theories that uh, through the Nepal Leadership Academy of Daipo we have looked at, um, of which uh, I'm going to go over two that most prominently uh, see, uh, find themselves in the work that Daipo does. The first is uh, theories of Professor Ron Heifetz at Harvard Center for Public Leadership. Uh, Ron's work uh, is, is, is seminal um, in terms of the way he looks at what is the difference between authority and leadership. He fundamentally asks, who is a leader? Is leader someone who has authority, formal authority, or can someone with or without formal authority also be able to lead? And, um, and, uh, and he goes over how uh, leadership is probably a verb. It's not an adjective, it's not a noun, it's a verb. It's about taking action. As opposed to so as opposed to position, it's more about progress. Um, as opposed to personality, it's more about presence. Uh, the second uh, uh, key concept in Ron's work is the difference between technical leadership and adaptive leadership. Uh, he describes technical leadership as as the type of leadership where you you know what the problem is, uh, such as such as creating a you know a chair you know a carpenter knows you know how to put together a chair and um, yeah, so so the, the solution is known and the problem is known and the solution is also known it's it's a technical solution so you know that you have to put together the four legs and then the platform and then the backrest and you need to use the nail and the hammer in a certain way the carpenter knows to do all these things to put together a chair and so that's a technical solution and thirdly the person who does the work is the technical expert, is the person who has the authority of knowledge and here in this case it's the carpenter. So that's technical leadership. Technical leadership versus adaptive leadership is where in adaptive leadership we're looking at these, these colossal, colossal issues such as climate change, such as corruption, such as youth unemployment in Nepal where, where we don't know where to begin. We, we don't have a good grasp of what the problem is. Is the problem with politicians? Is the problem with community? Is the problem poverty? Is the pro what? So we do not have a clear idea of what the problem is. Secondly, we, all, we also don't know what the solution is. I mean, there are of course myriad uh, policy papers and, and ideas that of course are presented to Nepal government every year, but we don't know what the solution exactly is. And uh, well, I mean, if we did, then we would have already had implemented it, wouldn't we? And we wouldn't have this problem of 1,500 youth thronging to the airport. And thirdly, uh, who does the work? And here it's not the expert. It's the people with the problem that need to do the work. So in this case, different from the case of Carpenter putting together a chair, it's the local communities, it's the young people that do not have the jobs that they need to do the work. So that's the difference between technical and adaptive leadership, and uh, adaptive leadership is really at the heart of what uh, Daipo has been doing. Second, uh, uh, second le leadership theory is, is drawn from the works of Professor Marshall Gant at uh, Harvard Leading Change Network. And uh, Marshall is a very interesting person, he's a great uh, human being. Uh, but also a wonderful professional who was a junior in college, at Harvard College and then he says, well, let me apply what I'm learning. And so he goes to the West and works with Sajar Chavez, 29 years organizing farm workers, then he comes back to Harvard, does his senior year, and then his PhD and begins to teach. So a, a lot of uh, Marshall's work is really about uh, in-practice uh, teachings. So uh, the first uh, idea around community organizing is, is about transforming what you have, which is the people, into what you need, which is the power, to get what you want, which is that progress, which is that change. So um, uh, Marshall's community organizing it has, has that philosophy. And there are five uh, key elements to Marshall's community organizing principles. The first is around creating a shared story. Um, so, so that a person knows what this person's call to leadership is. The person is able to also relate this to others in the room and is able to mobilize strategic action. So the first is around creating a shared story. The second is around using these shared stories to create intentional relationship. 
now that I know my problem, I want to create these intentional relationships with people and, and see who of them want to come together and form a team. So the third uh, aspect of this work is creating some shared structure, a team which believes in a certain mission, vision, uh, and, and decides to progress, proceed, uh, move forward. And the fourth one is about creating a shared strategy, which is about which is about really looking at the difference between power over and power with. So in, in, in communities, uh, there is a certain group that has power over the others, and community organizing is about how to build capability of the people that have the problems so that their power increases and eventually there is power with, so that they can then begin to bring change to us towards a more just world. And, and the fifth principle is, is, is really about, you know, it's not just that the team does work, the team needs to mobilize actions from others. So the, the fourth one is on creating shared commitments. Uh, so those are the five principles. Um, and I had the privilege uh, of working with Marshall and Ron for about 18 months uh, before coming to Nepal. I, uh, I spent about 18 months with them doing some research at the Harvard Center for Public Leadership. And the model that came, we came up with was the LEAD framework. The LEAD framework, uh, building on Marshall's and Ron's work, and, and we have also begun to now incorporate works of Peter Sange, works of uh, Carol Dweck at Stanford, and, and some other professors, we've also begun to incorporate the uh, LEAD framework, but it has four components, four, uh, four leadership uh, qualities uh, that we want to enhance in youth. The first is around listening to oneself. I mean, you know, one of the things that we note in young people in Nepal, and for that matter, is probably true for most of the world, is there's a lot of impatience to begin to take immediate action. Not enough thought is being put into, why am I being called to lead? There's not enough thought put into, what's the agency within me? Right? And, and so this, this the, the first, um, pr uh, facet of this work is, is around um, listening to oneself so that one truly gains the freedom from within and realizes the agency to take action. The second, the second uh, facet, the second uh, quality that we're trying to enhance in young people is one of empathy. I mean, it's not enough that you just understood yourself. It's important that you understand others. And when I mean others, it's not just people that support you. It's also people that oppose you, and, and very importantly, it's people who are on the sidelines, who are neither supporting you nor opposing you. So these are sort of the swing voters. Uh, um, and so the empathy model is really about understanding and feeling the pain of others and, 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 and thus understanding what the situation looks like, what this adaptive problem looks like. The third um, quality that we want to enhance in young people is one of analysis. So now that you've understood yourself, you've understood what others are feeling, how do you begin to uh, get a good grasp of what is the adaptive problem? Right? And so there are all these different perspectives, but what is the issue? And, and amongst all these issues, at what layer of abstraction do you want to begin intervening? So uh, the analy analyze module it goes into understanding the work and the system and comes up with uh, action options. Finally, the do module is about you know now that you know you've done some diagnosis, it's about time to now go out in the world and begin to take some action. And this is about mobilizing strategic action. It's about strengthening the organizational capability so that this work is not just an arrow of a campaign, but it has the circle. The circles that are important for institutional um, institution building. So, four components to our leadership model: uh, L, E, A, D, and LEAD is the framework that we have been using at the IQA to nurture the leadership capability of young uh, business innovators, young social innovators, young pol political innovators. And uh, moreover, we've also in addition to just coming up with this framework, over the last five years, we've also begun to contextualize this heavily for Nepal. So almost every case study that we use here 
are not only written in Nepali but are also of Nepali context. So they are of you know, our ancient kings, Lord Gautam Buddha, they are of our young uh, business entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs, they are of our women advocates. So, so all case studies are of Nepali leaders. Uh, and so like I said, you know, Daitwa um, it uses this leadership model to promote economic empowerment by, by promoting entrepreneurs on the ground, leveraging the learning to support government coming up with entrepreneurship policies, and turning this learning into an action, into a global campaign for an enterprising Nepal. So this is sort of the first half of uh, this presentation where I covered uh, what is the leadership model that we're using and, and I, I, be, I began touching upon how it relates to Daitwa. So now I'm going to go over what Daitwa actually does um, and, uh, and then show the implication of this leadership uh, model in our work. So like I said, you know, there's, so much, uh, there's so much work, talent, uh, energy, passion that have been invested in Nepal in the social political environment and not enough in economic environment. And so Daitwa is trying to contribute to reversing this paradigm by focusing on economic empowerment with the hope that this would lead to social political transformation. And, and thus, um, you know, we've decided to focus on rural entrepreneurs. Um, so here is here's a rural entrepreneur and and we, we want, what we want to do is we want to look at um, how do we transform growth-oriented micro-entrepreneurs into high-growth small entrepreneurs. So that's the conundrum that Daiwa is trying to uh, understand and work on. Because and the reason why we pick growth-oriented micro-entrepreneurs is that there's a lot of work being done in Nepal in the area of poverty alleviation and thus with micro-entrepreneurs, but not enough in the way of economic growth. So we can begin to leverage the pipeline of micro-entrepreneurs that the government and others have created and take them on the growth trajectory. So that's, that's sort of where we are trying to head. And also, you know, uh, like many developing countries, there's a significant missing middle. There's a lot of work done with the very poor. There's a lot of work being done here because banks are interested in uh, middle and uh, large enterprises. They would be happy to fund them. But there's a significant missing middle Daiwa is looking to support particularly these uh, growth-oriented micro-entrepreneurs who are looking for anywhere between $5,000 to $50,000 worth of uh, investment. And, and one important way we do this work is by thinking about a two-pronged approach. Uh, what this means is, first, we enable these young rural entrepreneurs to realize the push from inside, the push from within. Second is we support them in realizing the pull from outside. Because if they don't realize the push from inside, this pull from outside wouldn't be able to do much. Right? So unless there is the glow from within, the gloss from without is not going to be enough. So we take a two-pronged approach and, and to really enable young people to realize the push from inside, we provide them with this leadership course and we then also provide these entrepreneurs with, a, uh, with seed funding, training, mentorship and networking throughout the year so that they are able to technically grow as well. So that's the work that we do with rural entrepreneurs and it's, it, it is done over, the, over a whole year and we have community innovation labs in uh, different districts that we do with local partners. So far we're working in four districts of Nepal. To this, to do this uh, work, and uh, in doing this work, uh, Daitwa takes a 4E approach as well. So it's not just the entrepreneur that we focus on. We are also looking at the enterprise, the ecosystem, and the economy. So there are four E's to this. Um, in a short presentation, we don't have enough time. But we also wanted to say that this Rural Enterprise Acceleration Program also um, collaborates with academia, with NGOs, with government, with banks, and private sector in supporting these entrepreneurs. We have 
Um, you know, every year we have a bunch of young MBA students that go and live with our entrepreneurs to support them. We have uh, been collaborating with Ministry of Industry from the very day one. We have support from one of the national banks in Nepal. We collaborate with local NGOs. We have private sector collaboration as well. So that we can truly begin to strengthen community leadership. Uh, and <coughs> um, here's an example of one woman entrepreneur, Devi Malla. When, when she joined us um, uh, at the beginning of last year, um, just about maybe about um, uh, 12 to 14 months ago, <coughs> She was doing vegetable farming, she was doing tomatoes, um, and uh, she had uh, some community mobilizing ability, but more could be done. And she, did, she wasn't so much aware of herself as a leader. And over a whole year, today she is selected as one of our top five women entrepreneurs in the Palpa district. She does, uh, she uses tunnel farming uh, uh, technology that she had, wasn't used to before to, to grow and increase the yield of tomatoes and cauliflowers. And uh, we're very proud that she's making about you know, roughly about three thousand dollars per month over a whole year, and, uh, and 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 you know we're very excited that uh, not only is she economically empowered, but she recently ran for local elections. Now this is this is sort of like I mean, she's she would be a wonderful example of how you know a flood that economic empowerment can lead to social political transformation is actually in the making. She did not win the election. But she took that risk, right? and that's important. She made those efforts, and that's important. Um, the other key feature of our entrepreneurship program is that uh, every entrepreneur in the next five years, every Daiko entrepreneur over the next five years, is expected to support at least ten other young entrepreneurs in that community to grow. To this. So, so this person mentors, and uh, we've we've begun looking at community-based entrepreneurship models whereby our Daito entrepreneur goes up the value chain and brings in other entrepreneurs to fill the production void. So this is something that we've begun to do because, and, and, and using this, it has made sense for our Daito entrepreneur to support others as well from a business standpoint. All this learning uh, that we do in four districts, Palpa, Gulmi, uh, Ramechap and Mahwanpur, and uh, the work that we are uh, you know, about to I think the number is going to be about 45 and 23 entrepreneurs, 35 we've already worked with so far. So 45 entrepreneurs, 23 of them will be women. All this learning would support to enhance the program, but we don't want it to be limited to just our learnings. So uh, we use this learning to inform policy making. And that's where we have this governance lab program. And the governance, through Governance Lab, we have two types of activities. The first is a policy fellowship research, and the second is action research. Uh, in policy uh, fellowship research, we find young people, young, talented, energetic people like Surya Karki, who, who are maybe in Nepal, may not be in Nepal, and we try and connect them with government agencies and parliamentarians who need some research support. Um, so the way it works is we, we, we go to these policy makers and ask them what, what type of research gaps they have. We then do a global call for application and find very talented young people like Surya who work anywhere between three to six months with, these, uh, with their par partner agencies or parliamentarians. And in this case, Surya worked with the former Prime Minister, Madhav Kumar Nepal, to improve education system in, uh, in the constituency of the former Prime Minister. And, uh, and here also we're using a two-pronged approach. Uh, we're using, again, the Daiko's lead framework, where we want to enable Surya to realize the push from inside by providing him with a leadership course, and the pull from outside by providing him with, him with, a, with a, a series of excuse me, research, um, uh, research tools. Uh, Surya is founder of uh, the Allo Foundation, so he has continued to go on this journey of public service. He was recently listed as, as Forbes 30 under 30. Uh, and um, I, I still remember when Surya in an, at the end of the fellowship when we organized the symposium, he said he would like to be the youngest prime minister of the country. And I really hope this, this comes true. Uh, so this is one program that we have, and so far we've worked uh, with 70, on 78 different public innovation projects. 
78 fellows from 24 countries around the world have come to Nepal and worked in 20 public agencies and with 25 parliamentarians from across the political parties uh, to, to come with a variety of ideas. I'm very proud to say half of these young people are today back in Nepal and some of them have even applied for the civil service exams. So the other, the other type of uh, work that uh, we also do um, in, in our governance program is that of action research. Because you know, our fellows come up with ideas, these ideas may not get entertained. So we work with you know, authority figures such as former bureaucrats. We have recently begun to work with Harvard University's evidence-based policy design group so that some of these ideas of the fellows begin, informs the decisions of policy makers. Now, as I said in the beginning, the DIPA is a campaign for nurturing an enterprising mindset. We just don't want our works to be limited to the works that we did on the ground uh, with entrepreneurs uh, in the form, in the way of you know, nurturing you know, 10, 20, 30, 45,000 entrepreneurs. We also want to be limited to just a bunch of research process that we're doing with the government. For us, this is, this is a collection of experiences that, are, that we want to leverage, to shape the identity of our country for nurturing and enterprising Nepal. And thus, we have this third cluster of activities done through the Nepal Leadership Academy. And we provide a myriad of uh, leadership courses all the way from half a day to a year-long courses. Um, and, and done, you know, of course, uh, in collaboration with our uh, Harvard professors. We offered uh, the leading innovation course to 20 Daipa innovation leaders. These were 20 people that came from politics, civil society, bureaucracy, and private sector, all different um, spheres of life. We provided them with the training and they did projects after this training. Uh, we've also recently done uh, work with the Ministry of Health where we build capability of um, government teams to innovate and address the limited availability of essential drugs at uh, primary health facilities in Nepal. We did this in three districts and this has led to some real results where, uh, where the availability of drugs has gone up. Um, and and uh, Daipo is not just in Nepal, but we have uh, an important wing in the US. Uh, and in the US, this is a picture from a walkathon that we organized where more than 600 people came together to raise about $40,000 for 40 Nepal-based NGOs. Um, so I've, I've come to the end of uh, the presentation, and um, you know, like, um, like I said, you know, this is a global campaign to nurture enterprising minds in, in Nepal. So I'd, we would love to collaborate with uh, the students at the University of Edinburgh. We would love to collaborate with the professors here. And, uh, and there are three ideas, but you know, there's of course more uh, that we can probably do. There's Nepal Leadership Track that we organize every year, and last year we had uh, five uh, young people from five different countries that came to Nepal, and there are five Nepalese. So the ten of them went on a leadership track, uh, and, uh, and what they did was it was an inner journey of leadership and learning. So as they went uh, on a physical track, uh, they took this leadership course which allowed them to explore Nepal and ask very fundamentally challenging leadership questions to oneself and, and understand uh, the leader that what, where in them. So that's Nepal Leadership Track. We'll do one this summer as well. So very much invited. Second is uh, you know, opportunities for research collaboration and this could be done in different fields. It could be in entrepreneurship, governance, leadership. We're very open. Uh, to these ideas. I understand uh, your course also uses the uh, U-Labs, U-Theory. In fact, the work that we did with Ministry of Health used uh, U-Labs work, so, so there, there could be potential collaborations there. And, and we'd, happy, we'd be very delighted to welcome some of summer interns who can come here uh, for a couple of months. Uh, and, and if some of you are interested in sort of doing long-term dissertation work or thesis work, that's also very welcome. Uh, we've had a uh, you know, good relationship with Harvard where sometimes students have come for a short term between, for two weeks over the winter, sometimes they've come for three months. So different types of possibilities exist in terms of students coming to Nepal. Um, so here are three opportunities, but these are just beginnings and, and we very much welcome your own inputs uh, on, on what we could do together. 
and, and most importantly, you know, this is a shared journey of, of learning for us. So if you have any feedback on what we're doing and what if, if this did not make sense, uh, and if you had any curiosities, questions, please let us know. And we'd be happy to learn from you and your experiences and, and refine this process so that together uh, we can work on, uh, on nurturing enterprise mindset in Nepal. Thank you very much for your time and attention.